and would have multiple metal rods. Bro, bro. Ah, I just read the next line, Kevin. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome on this show. Why was one of my writers, this case, Kevin? Thank you, Kevin. Has written me a script, Bad Medicine, History's Most Insane Medical Treatments. Well, Kevin, pros and cons, you know. Cons, surgery without anesthetic. Pros, cocaine, opium. They would just be like, oh, <coughs> Doc, I'm feeling a little bit sick. I'm tired and I'm feeling a bit sick. He's like, well, don't worry. We'll give you some opium for that cough. And you're feeling a little bit tired? Have a little cocaine. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe mix them together in some sort of beverage and call it Coca-Cola. We're all fortunate enough to have born in the age, to have been born in the age of modern medicine. A lot of things that we take for granted have been around for our entire lives, so it can be a bit hard to imagine a time before they existed. No, it's not. It's not that hard to imagine. It's that like, you know when you go to the dentist and they're like, Pfft! And you're like, Jesus Christ, I can feel it through the anesthetic. And in the past, they'd just be like, okay, you just gotta, you know, just like grab on real tight. Think of uh, happy thoughts. It's not that hard to imagine. And it'd be f***ing horrible. It's easy to forget that germ theory wasn't accepted until the mid-1800s, and that the world's first antibiotic was discovered less than a century ago, a discovery that was made by accident. For thousands of years of recorded history, before we understood how diseases actually work, people had some pretty wild ideas and even crazier treatments. Some of them at least made logical sense, like trepanation. If you have persistent headaches that make your head feel like it's going to explode, drilling a hole to release the pressure seems like a reasonable solution. They drill holes in people's heads though, right? If you've had like some brain accident or whatever and there's pressure building up in your skull, they'll be like and drill a little hole in there. I mean, it's not going to be like in the past where they'd use like a hand drill or something and just be like, oh, guys, let the spirits out. It's for like a medical reason. But I think they still do that, right? It's a terrible idea and it didn't work. Okay, never mind. But since nothing was cleaned or sterilized back then, I'm pretty sure the patients were all too busy dying of infection to mention that their headaches hadn't gone away. Oh, but they had Kevin because they were dead. It's like, <laughs> they definitely didn't have a headache anymore. Whoa, look at that hole. No kidding, it's gigantic! Let me interrupt today's video to tell you about our fantastic sponsor, Skillshare. Look, are you ready to redefine work? Find new possibilities? And if you're not, you should be. And you can do it with Skillshare. Look, work is changing. The old ways of work not really cutting it anymore. It's time to break free from the 9 to 5 and explore new possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that you should quit your job or anything, but why not explore, see what's out there, learn some new skills, maybe do that thing you've been dreaming of doing. Skillshare have launched an incredible digital campaign that's all about answering the question, what's next after the great resignation? Skillshare could be your ticket to a world where you can design a career that fits you perfectly. They offer hundreds of career-focused classes, not just in photography, film, and illustration, but in so much more. Look, whether you're a self-taught learner, career changer, or just an expert side hustler, Skillshare has got something for everyone. Are you ready to explore where you're headed next? Skillshare's the place to do it. With a Skillshare membership, you gain access to a treasure trove of valuable skills and experiences that will take your career to the next level. And the best part, you can do it at your own pace, on your own terms. Skillshare isn't just about learning new skills, it's about creating new opportunities. Whatever your goal is, find your creative voice, attracting clients, making creativity your full-time job, Skillshare allows you to achieve it all. Personally, I've been recently diving into classes in productivity and time management because I don't know, I already see my myself as a fairly productive person, pretty productive, but there's always new things to learn. Now, here's the exciting part. Skillshare are offering you a one-month free trial. That's right, the first thousand people to click the link in the description below. We're going to an entire month to explore Skillshare for free. So thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring, and now back to today's video. Even something a bit more outlandish like physician-induced orgasms partially makes sense. Female hysteria isn't a real illness, and I don't understand how society decided that orgasms would be an appropriate treatment for it. But since that's what happened, I definitely get why a bunch of pervy doctors would be on board with spending their days wrist deep in pelvic massages holy sh <clears throat> the past everybody however the treatments we'll be looking at today seem to defy nearly all logic and reason it does the body good. Believe it or not, blood transfusions date back at least to the 1500s. Spanish conquistadors reported witnessing successful blood transfusion by the Incas, and they brought these tales back to Europe. Of course, the Incas rarely receive any credit for this because they weren't European and thus weren't important. <laughs> <laughs> they were just too stupid. Ah, who came up with that? They were just doing it. The Spanish were like, hmm, that looks like an idea that we had. <laughs> 
You could argue it's because the only evidence of Incan transfusions is anecdotal tales from the conquistadors, but it seems unlikely that random explorers would have somehow invented fake stories detailing advanced and very real medical techniques. While these stories certainly were of interest back in Europe, the first records of an actual blood transfusion experiment wouldn't take place until the 1600s, when British physician Richard Lower would have a go at it with a couple of dogs. The experiment was successful in that the recipient survived, though Richard had gone a little ham and drained too much blood from the donor. Oh my god, <laughs> there's just one dog and he's like bursting with blood and the other dog's like, help, I need more blood. Okay, let's put some back. They probably didn't. The other dog probably just died and then the other dog probably exploded from an overabundance of blood because it was the past and who gives a shit about animals? It was a good start, but medicine was still a bit shit back then and nobody understood how anything worked. Richard went on to transfuse lamb's blood into a mental patient in the hopes that the lamb's calm and gentle nature would help cure the man's insanity. <laughs> how have I never heard of that? That's f***ing insane. It did not, because that is not how science works. Eventually, <laughs> governments banned animal to human transfusions because people kept dying. It's like, wh I, I don't understand why you would have to buy that. All the doctors are like, yeah, we keep trying to put lamb's blood into people and it just ends up killing them. Why would you continue to do that? Why does the government need to be, stop it? <laughs> Stop it! The doctors be like, we're just killing people. Everyone's dying from lamb's blood injections. And it would take roughly 150 years for transfusions to make a comeback. When they find... <laughs> Did anyone think maybe we should do it from person to person? And even then, there's people with different blood types. It's not gonna work. When they finally saw a resurgence in the 1800s, doctors were ready to perform human-to-human -human transfusions. Unlike the earlier attempts, they were finally confident they could get blood from a human donor without having to completely bleed out the person and thus kill them. This much was true, but there was another problem. That problem is blood types. The Incas were able to perform drop blood transfusion because either by dumb luck or because of anthropological complexities that we don't need to get into right now, the Incas were almost exclusively type O blood. Okay, O negative. There's O positive and O negative. O positive is largely a donor and O negative is a universal donor, right? And then AB negative is the universal recipient. <laughs> That's the one you wanna be. like. O negative, you can donate to everyone, So, but you can only receive O negative, which is not a good position to be in if there's some like blood emergency. But if you're AB negative, you can't really donate blood because you can only donate to the small percentage of people that are AB negative, but you can take everyone's blood. It's like the selfish one. That's the one you want. Europeans not only had the full range of blood types, but they wouldn't even know the blood types existed until the early 1900s. It's like 100 years ago. It's crazy how far science has come in just 100 years. This resulted in patient after patient dying from receiving incompatible blood. I mean, at least it wasn't lamb's blood, though. At least they moved on from that. Then in the mid-1800s, there was a cholera pandemic. Doctors still wanted to kill patients by trying to save them with blood transfusions, but they no longer wanted to risk bringing in healthy donors who might wind up contracting cholera. In Europe, they tried to create artificial blood, but doctors in North America had a better idea. There's a better idea beside artificial blood? Isn't that still a thing we're trying to crack today? Like, that'd be incredibly useful. What liquid beside blood is synonymous with life and vitality, making it perfect use as a substitute in blood transfusion is going to be something insane, isn't it? It's going to be like, oh, what did we do? Well, we blood wasn't working, so we just injected them full of piss or semen. I am sickened, but curious. If you guessed milk, then you'd have made a great doctor 200 years ago. <laughs> That's even more insane. No, it's not more insane than injecting someone with piss. But milk? Really? I feel like lamb's blood was closer, boys, and this was like hundreds of years before you were having a crack with milk. That's disgusting. Have you not left milk out in the sun? Do you not know what it's like after a little while? It's gross. In 1854, Toronto doctors James Bovell and Edwin Hodler performed the first ever milk transfusion, pumping 12 ounces of milk directly into the patient. They're gonna fucking die, dude. That's not a clever idea. And this was still like a decade before pasteurization was invented. So not only is it like regular milk, it's milk that's more likely, is it, it's got all sorts of germs in it. So it was that good raw shit that's swarming with bacteria. The idea was that this person is you're so f***ed. The idea was that milk was already strongly connected to life, and over time, the white milk would turn into white blood cells. Yeah, 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 well done, because they're called the same name. That's right, that's how it works. After being carefully injected with milk, the 40-year-old patient went on to make a full recovery. They tried it again, and the next transfusion was also a success. You're f***ing shitting me. How is that person not dead? You injected them with unpasteurized milk. Now, granted, I don't know how much 12 ounces is, but I get the feeling it's like maybe a can of Coke's worth. Right? Hey, Siri, how much is 12 ounces in milliliters? 
fucking nailed it. It's basically a can of Coke. It's a little more than a can of Coke. That's amazing. Milk. The next five attempts all killed the patients. But remember those first two? Those were great. Yeah, yeah. You, you're basically killing two out of every three and you're like, cracking. Despite the low initial success rate, milk transfusion became all the rage across North America. Oh, once they became more widespread, it quickly became clear that those first two survivors must have been a fluke. In one instance, the milk caused a patient's blood pressure to drop so rapidly that he had to be quickly revived using a combination of morphine and whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> See, the fast medicine wasn't so bad, was it? Was it? It's like, what's the cure? Well, you're just gonna have to drink of it and have some morphine. Oh, no! Though he still wound up, wound up dying a few days later. Yeah, but at least he was happy. Though they initially only used cow milk, doctors began experimenting with goat and human milk as well, with equally lethal results. The practice remained common in North America for almost a full decade. Four real doctors really before doctors finally gave up and replaced their bottles of milk with bags of saline a much more effective alternative the cure is inside you all along do you wish there was a singular drug that could treat kidney and liver problems soothe itchy eyelids treat diaper rash cure cancer cure covid and whiten your teeth yeah it's gonna be something like arsenic isn't it because it's the past it turns out the answer was inside you all along. At least it was until you peed it out. Oh, this is like the people who drink piss and think it's like a medical cure, when really it's just they want to drink piss because, uh, I don't know, fetishes, fetishing? Mm. Nice and sweet, anyway. For over 5,000 years, the drinking of one's own urine, or urine therapy, has been practiced by people all over the world. It's unfortunately, it's unfortunately a form of alternate medicine that has refused to die off, and it's even included in some medical texts. Obviously, not very credible medical texts, but medical texts nonetheless. Why not just call them quackery, then? I mean... I could put together a medical text this afternoon, which would have no basis in fact. No, there's a medical text. Because there's no, like, it's not a medical journal. There's no one peer reviewing that, you know, Simon's rubbing your feces in your eyelids cures his COVID thing is, is real. But I could certainly write it and call it a medical text, couldn't I now? Couldn't I? But let's not do that. And don't rub sh rub sh in your eyes. It's not going to cure your COVID, as far as I'm aware. Despite thousands of years of claims about all of the various ailments that could be treated or cured with urine, there's absolutely no scientific evidence that it has any benefit at all. And why the f would it? Urine is just water filled with a bunch of crap that your body was actively trying to get rid of. Why would putting it back in your body help? Not only is it not beneficial, it can be actively harmful to you. What? Drinking your own piss could be harmful? <laughs> Who would have thought that? Who would have thought, yeah, 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 no, I'm gonna drink that. That's gonna be good for me, fucking idiots. It's actually a bit ironic that urine therapy was used to treat kidney problems, as doing so could actually damage your kidneys by putting unnecessary strain on them. Sadly, as long as there are quack doctors and wilderness survival documentaries, there will continue to be some segment of the population that insists on pushing the lie that drinking your own piss is good for you. You're not ready. Call me Ishmael. Everything is bigger in Australia. I've seen pictures of bats that were four foot tall with a three foot wingspan being swallowed by snakes. Jesus Christ, Australia. Adult snakes being eaten by frogs. 20 foot long crocodiles that are basically just dinosaurs. And spiders bigger than my head. Jesus, no way. There's not spiders this big, is there? How big's Kevin's head? Maybe this big. <laughs> That's a big ass spider, Australia. It should come as no surprise, then, that their animal remedies are jumbo-sized as well. Why settle for boring old medicinal leeches when you can use a whole ass whale instead? This practice began with the Ewins, a nation of Aboriginal people in southern Australia. But just like with the Incas, they weren't European, so nobody cared. The most commonly told origin of the medicinal whales is attributed to some drunk guy in Twofold Bay. According to the story, some idiot was walking drunk along the beach when they encountered a whale carcass. This wasn't unusual as Twofold Bay was a whaling community, rather than getting big boats to hunt whales in the ocean and strip them for parts while still at sea, this particular bay was known for employing smaller boats that would snag migrating whales and drag them to shore to be cut up. It was one of these whales that the man encountered. The whale had already been sliced open, and in his drunken stupor, the man fell inside the whale. And because his friends were arseholes, they just left him there. I'd say they left him because they were Australian, so they saw it as an opportunity to go and rob his house, but South Australia was the only British colony at the time that wasn't being used as a dumping ground for convicts. Hours later, the man emerged from the whale car is completely cured of his drunkenness. 
cured of his drunkenness, he was just in a whale carcass, not drinking. He just sobered up. More impressively, he also claimed to be cured of his rheumatoid arthritis. It was believed that the whale blubber had acted as a sort of giant poultice, and this whale cure for arthritis began making headlines worldwide. <laughs> How do you cure it? Just go have a nap in a whale. Jesus, a whale, rotting whale carcass. In Australia's hot, it probably stinks. How do you fall into a whale? Jesus. Oh, wow, that's my decoy, sweetie. I leave it here whenever I go out. Oh. Whalers would drag their catches to the beach, cut holes that paying customers could slide themselves inside. They would be inserted into the blubber and intestines up to at least their waist, if not their shoulders, and then the opening would be sealed as tightly as possible, lest the gases leak out and kill the person. Oh yes, it was also very important to begin this process while the carcass was still at least somewhat warm. Cold intestines just don't have the same healing properties. What the f are you up to people in the past while some people would spend as little as two hours inserted into the whale to receive minor relief it seems the most common duration of whale bathing was 20 to 30 hours you are never gonna smell the same again this was supposed to cure a person of their arthritis pain for up to a year the whale cure remained available until world war one by which point the whaling in twofold bay had already been experiencing a steady decline however it's difficult to know exactly how popular it remained as the years went on according to one testimonial from the early 1900s the after effects are not so pleasant. The patient for a week or so gives off a horrible odor and is abhorrent to man and beast and fit for prosecution under the Diseased Animals and Meat Act. Jesus Christ. It's gonna smell bad. The smelly smell that smells. Smelly. That's hardly a ringing endorsement, and there is absolutely no scientific evidence that a treatment like this would even remotely be effective in treating arthritis. To the shock of absolutely nobody. But really, uh, what else could an arthritis patient do in the 1800s? Your options were to either suffer with chronic pain or to spend 30 hours inside a whale carcass followed by a week in exile because of the stench or go to the corner store and buy copious amounts of morphine. Well, I'm going to say the morphine actually does something. I'd say that's an easy choice, but then again, Australia's a scary place. You wouldn't want to be walking around high as balls when you got close to a 20-foot crocodile's lake or passed out under a drop bear's tree. Kickstart your journey. Erectile dysfunction is extremely common, and the odds of experiencing it increase as you get older. There are a lot of different numbers surrounding how many men suffer from this condition, but the simplest explanation is that your odds of suffering at least from mild ED are the same as your age. So, 30% of men in their 30s have it, 40% in their 40s, and so on. What if you're 110? <laughs> There's a 110% chance you got it. You've got it so bad, your dick goes inside! Our dad had taught us not to be ashamed of our dicks. That's not really surprising as our bodies just start breaking down as they get older, but hopefully I'll just have to deal with chronic back pain rather than a broken dick. I know shot, man. If someone was like, do you want erectile dysfunction or chronic back pain? I'd take erectile dysfunction. Is that weird? Because there's a pill that solves that. Whereas chronic back pain, it's like you're going to get f***ed up on like, um, what's that drug that that family sold that got everyone in America addicted to opium? or opioids oxycodone oxycontin oxycontin whatever it was and it's like there's there's nothing for that like i'd definitely <laughs> i'd love erectile dysfunction of course while men today can rely on things like viagra to treat the symptoms pills don't actually do anything to address the cause of ed and as everybody in the 1800s knew the cause of impotence and erectile dysfunction was moral weakness it happens because you were a bad person who did did bad things particularly bad things to yourself and i think i know what they're talking about here <laughs> what dude okay that that's okay i get it that's gross, though. That's not how you do that. According to Dr. Samuel Gross in his 1881 book Practical Treatise on Impotence, Sterility, and Allied Disorders of the Male Sex Organs, ED was caused by masturbation, sexual excesses, and constant excitement of the genital organs without gratification. Except that doesn't actually make much sense. Was ED supposed to be caused by too much sex and masturbation, or not enough? Make up your bloody mind, doctor. I guess it was some sort of Goldilocks situation where your doctor had to prescribe you the amount, right amount of weekly organs. Orgasms. But what was a man suffering ED supposed to do? There weren't any little blue pills back in the 1800s, or if there were, they all just contained cocaine. With no medication to rely on, doctors would instead just have to give the man a little jump start, like a defibrillator, for your penis. Don't do it! I'm a virgin! There were a couple of different approaches that were taken for this. First was a galvanic bath in which doctors would seat a man in a bathtub full of water before applying electrodes to it. Because baths and electricity go so famously well together. What the f? 
Then again, I would rather carry a toaster with me into the tub than try the alternate form of treatment. In more severe cases of limp dick, a more severe and direct approach was going to be required. Men would have multiple metal ro- Bruh. Bro. Bro. Multiple metal rods inserted into their urethras. Ah, I just read the next line, Kevin! You're not ready. Which were then electrified for five to ten minutes to restore their vigor and ideally their rigor. Note that these treatments predated defibrillators by at least 50 years because the medical community had its priorities. As the popularity of these treatments grew, companies began selling belts to let weak men electrocute their penises in the privacy of their own home. They could even be purchased through mail-order catalogs so that the men wouldn't have to suffer the shame of visiting a doctor or purchasing one of the belts in person, and it was available for the low cost of only $18, which is nearly $700 in today's money. Hopefully Simon hasn't already mentioned this, but the uh, en- but this entry actually has a little bit of a plot twist. I don't want any more twists on this entry, Kevin. It's already ha. Oh. Jesus. While electrocuting your penis to treat erectile dysfunction sounds like an insane treatment devised by quacks, it's actually making a comeback. Oh shit. Particularly in Europe. I've never heard of this one. There are even a number of research studies to demonstrate the efficacy of what's now referred to as shockwave therapy. And didn't we fix this with drugs, though? <laughs> of course, these studies have faced criticism for using different and questionable methodologies, and the jury's still very much out on whether or not they're actually effective or in any way. Wait, we found something effective. It's called Viagra. <laughs> like, why would you electrocute your cock, people? Don't do it. One of the big issues with most of these studies is the lack of control group to test for the placebo effect, though admittedly that's a pretty tough problem to tackle with this sort of treatment. It hasn't happened to me before, and God willing it never will, but I'm pretty confident I would be able to tell whether or not somebody whether or not somebody's electrocuted my penis. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. It's like, ooh. Did someone just electrocute my cock? (laughs) Kudos to anyone that can actually devise a placebo that would fool people. But even proponents of this treatment acknowledge that it isn't actually a permanent cure. You'd still have to go and electrocute your junk every few months with each course of treatment taking one to two weeks. Or instead of repeatedly slapping electrodes all over your dick, you can just go to the pharmacy and get the pill that we already know works. Exactly. What is going on, medicine? We fixed this one. We don't need to fix it worse. Um, thank you everybody for watching. That's where we end today's video. See you next time. <laughs> they definitely didn't have a headache anymore. Whoa, look at that hole. No kidding, it's gigantic. <laughs>